Number 10, the cube. All right, Transformers fans, let's do this. I feel like we're hearing more about these things like UFOs or UAPs, whatever you wanna call them now. I feel like we're hearing about them now more than ever. So why not kick this weird list off with something off world? We have to include some alien cover-ups, right? It's me, it's Taylor, why not? I figured that I'd find one that's also not too well known. We haven't seen this one, you know on YouTube all the time. Not too long ago, this spinning cube looking craft or drone or something, it was spotted over Missouri, just lurking in the same spot, just hovering. And then it would zoom off. Folks could see it with their naked eye on the ground. It was also pretty obvious. It was eye grabbing, it was shiny in the sky. Only a couple hours later, it was seen again, but this time it was 700 miles away. This time it was 44 year old Matthew Jandeka. He was minding his own business, hanging out on the porch, just doing his, you know, Sunday, Sunday stuff. When this cube, again, this floaty cube caught his attention. It was a sunny day, the light reflecting off the cube caught his eye, but then a day later, another guy, 30 year old Justin Johnson, he saw the same thing. But this time he saw it while he was driving home, which is also pretty distracting. The light and the reflections also caught his eye. He says, at first I thought maybe it was a balloon, but the movements were too odd. In a world full of deep fakes, I mean, do we believe this account? Is this real? Lately everyone's talking about how these UFOs are spheres, so maybe this video is that of a sphere. Not a cube, that's cool. I love teaching geometric shapes via alien aircraft. I'm like, this is a triangle. We saw this one in the Navy, then we saw this cube in the sky. Number nine, Amityville photo. Okay, we'll go less UFOs, more ghosts. One M. Night Shyamalan theme to the other, here we go. This photo was taken inside the actual Amityville house back in 1976. It's a young man, it appears, with glowing white eyes. How comforting is that? Pretty, pretty hard to miss there, he's got the glowing Yep, looks very Sin City of him, just to stare with his white eyes. Now, at first I thought this was from a horror movie, right? All those Amityville knockoffs. It looks obviously fake or set up in some way until you start to read about the details here. See this photo, it was taken with automatic cameras equipped with infrared, not an actual person. So this young lad here probably wasn't expecting a selfie. Why I wasn't smiling or throwing up a peace sign. Makes sense now. Photographer Gene Campbell set up the photo and took it back in 1976. Now at the time, Gene was working with paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren on the actual case. Huh. I'm scared now. This photo was revealed three years after it was taken on the Merv Griffin show, and many believe this is the ghost of John DeFeo, one of the victims in 1974. Now, you can't really do this anymore, right? You can't whip out photos from a otherwise crime scene and be like, okay gang, what do we think? Spirit or not a spirit? Vote, yes, no. Obviously there was backlash after this for obvious reasons, but it took three years for that photo to reach the public eye, and now everybody believes in ghosts, or they do a little more than they did before that show. This was long before The Conjuring movie as well, obviously, so this was quite random to see on TV. Do you believe in ghosts? What's the ratio here? Comment down below. I'm not a believer, I'm not gonna lie. I've tried numerous times. I got the Ouija board, did the whole thing. Felt nothing, man. Like an 18 year old on Christmas. I'm like, is that it? Is it done? Do I have to feel anything anymore? Number eight, Alfred Hitchcock and the MGM Lion. All right, you're gonna hear me roar after this one. This photo was from 1958. You've seen this at some point, right? Hopefully, or else, you know, we'll send over a VHS, we'll help you out. It was taken by Clarence Sinclair Bull. Now the photo appears to be, well, no, it doesn't appear to be at all. It's Alfred Hitchcock serving tea to a lion. Yeah, the famous MGM lion. His name's Leo, that's him, there he goes, he's getting tea. He loves suspense and tea, who would have thought? And company, it appears. North by Northwest was the only film that Hitchcock did with MGM. So there's a rumor now that he directed the lion's roar for the MGM intro, which is fun. But you're also like, okay, that's a real animal, that's kinda, that's sad. And also, that's probably nonsense. There have been seven MGM lions in total. Yeah, not just one, but Leo was known to be the most friendly. I wanna hear about the other six. I'm like, what happened there? He's still in the logo today. Today, but again, back in the 1950s, it's hard to say what it was really like on set. I mean, it's still a lion being held down for a photo, so probably wasn't a friendly vibe for that fella. Number seven, Gloria Steinem. Oh, here we go, a scandalous one. Back in 1963, the Playboy Club in New York City was booming. It was one of Hugh Hefner's greatest accomplishments at the time. This club was the talk of the town. That is until Gloria Steinem came in and started reporting some stuff. Gloria was a feminist writer. She's an icon. She created Miss Magazine back in 1972, but her career began much earlier around the 60s. See, she got a job as one of these Playboy bunnies, you know, must be a comfortable get up. And she worked at the club undercover, secretly taking note on how this key holders only <sighs> establishment was operating, right? Cool, what's going on here? What's the big scoop here? The staff were these 
young women, these beautiful young women, these bunnies. They had to wear the black bodysuits, the puffy white tails, the whole get up. And at age 28, Gloria worked undercover there for three weeks straight. And the piece she released after, appropriately titled A Bunny's Tale, Great title, by the way, she nailed that one. It got so much attention that it kickstarted her freelance career and also made her a feminist icon. This photo of Gloria undercover shows you the comfortable work outfits she had to endure just to get the story out. Yeah, doesn't look like she had her non-slips on there. That's, that's a write-up in my books. In a collection of her writings, Gloria reflects on the undercover piece, saying that it now has outlived all of the Playboy clubs, both here and abroad. That was before Hefner passed away in 2017, so I will add that you also outlived him as well. Good, he wasn't a very nice lad. Let's move on. Number six, North Sentinel Island. All right, we've got some people, some aliens, some ghosts. What else do we need, Taylor? How about some weird islands? Sure. North Sentinel Island. We gotta head over to India for this one. This island is the home of the Sentinelese tribe. You've probably heard about this at some point. One of the most forbidden islands in the world, but why? Located in the Bay of Bengal, North Sentinel Island is about 1,200 kilometers away from India. And while most islands are shrinking, this one actually grew back in 2014. Yeah, the universe is like more. Yeah, you need more of this, sure. The island lifted up a couple of meters during an earthquake, so the west and south sides, they gained an extra kilometer. Nice. DLC unlocked. The inhabitants on this island are among the few uncontacted tribes left in the world. They have apparently been there for 50,000 years, and there's no sign of agriculture or even fire. Yet somehow this tribe has thrived for ages. Now, if we try and get close, they will try and drive anybody away. More than fair, like we have enough room, we're good. Let's just leave. In fact, back in 2006, two fishermen sadly lost their lives because they got too close to the island without knowing who was on it or what the island was. Yeah, you can't just approach random islands. You gotta do some homework. That's why I'm here. Number five, Lascaux Cave. If you didn't visit this cave back in 1963 or sooner, well, you lost your chance because, well, humans ruin everything. Now we can't even see ancient art anymore because, well, it's too many of us. The Lascaux cave system is now a world heritage site in France, but once it was a booming tourist attraction. These cave paintings, see, they're 17,300 years old. They're quite ancient. We can't really touch them. You can't have someone write Steve was here on it. Can't do that. Paintings that depict cattle, bison, stags, you name it. They're beautiful. They're complex. And of course, like I said, they're extremely old. So old, in fact, that the cave was closed to the public forever in 1963 after it declared human presence wasn't healthy for the art. Yeah, our dirty coffee breath would eventually cause this art to fade away. So we had to hold our breath. We gotta leave. We gotta close it off. There we go. Plus, I'm sure somebody would have snuck in with a Sharpie by now and ruined it. You know what I mean? Or like graffiti. It would have been gone by now. You know it. 7,000 year old paintings. Yeah, protect these for another 17,000 years, please. Number four, Surtsey Island. Another fun island. Another weird story. Here we go. When it comes to new things in life, it's pretty rare that we get a new island, right? Especially on our planet when we're losing things and melting. How lucky are we? Sure. We're even luckier that Disney didn't build a resort here first because now scientists, now they get a chance to study what an island looks like without human interaction. That's a fun little project to focus on in the future. That's cool. It's pretty cool. It's weird and scary, but it's cool, I guess. Yeah, kind of nervous. I don't know. Surtsey Island in Iceland, as of right now, it's only open to a few scientists and geologists. Everybody else? Beat it, go find your own island, get out of here. It was born from a volcanic eruption back in 1963 and scientists, they have one rule on this island, don't talk about Fight Club. And the second rule is no seeds. Yeah, no life, no chance at life at all. Choose something else, anything else, please. One guy accidentally pooped out a tomato seed and he almost ruined the whole operation. The guy almost ruined his entire plan. What a stressful job, it's so eerie to see the oldest human history and then immediately after see a new island where humans are forbidden. It's like, we're not allowed to go and be places anymore. I'm kind of uh, not, that's not great. What are we doing here? I'm just breathing on things, I can't take a on this island? Number three, Spaceman. Look, we've all been photobombed before. It's a blessing in disguise. You look back at prom photos, some dude's trying to do a moonwalk in between, his face is like melting this way. It's great, you're like, ah, classic Jeff. It's the best. But when Jim Templeton took a photo of his daughter in a otherwise empty marsh long before Photoshop existed, and yet somehow there appears to be an astronaut in the background, well, that's not very fun, is it? That's a little bit concerning. Jim assures us that nobody was around when this photo was taken, which I of course believe, because why would you put your kid in a photo with whatever that is? That's, no, no thank you, it's not a weird, we're not gonna go and talk to that guy. Also, the fact that this man looks like he's from space, that ought to do it, that makes him more weird and believable. What are we looking at right now? I have no idea. Kodak even got involved in the story, like, Kodak. 
not Kodak Black, like the company that got involved. They confirmed this photo was not tampered with. Yeah, and that's Kodak, right? They don't lie about anything. Spider-Man leak, Kodak's like, nah, it's Andrew Garfield. Don't listen to that. So authentic, can confirm. Number two, nursing home spirit. This photo was taken from a nursing home resident the same night that another resident had passed away, which is an odd thing to do, just set up a camera thing right after. You're like, yeah, just in case, you know, maybe we'll catch one. Well, they did. This was back in 2015, and that night they heard a door open and close, but there were no visitors allowed at the time. So, you know, some, some Kodak was coming into the picture at this point. So now there's a great amount of people who think that this image is one of two things. It's either the spirit of the resident that passed away, or it's the Grim Reaper. Yeah, the door opening and closing, People think that was the Grim Reaper coming in and then leaving, which is so scary. How long was he in there? Was it like 46 seconds, four minutes? How long does this guy operate? Is he quick? Is it like busting tables? Is he just like, all right, let's do this. Is he like Santa Claus? I feel like he's like Santa Claus. A few comments were also saying that it's comforting, this photo, to know that in the end you aren't alone, and that you have someone assisting you to the um, afterlife. No, I'm good. I'd rather die alone than have uh, whatever that is break into my home and closing open doors. I'm good. And finally, number one, the Battle of Los Angeles, or lack thereof. We'll see, I don't know, this is a weird one. Of course, we have to end on one of the most unspeakable battles, photos, whatever you wanna call it, of all time. The Battle of Los Angeles, otherwise known as the Great Los Angeles Air Raid, happened during World War II, right at the end of February 1942. Now, this event, first of all, took place only a few months after the Pearl Harbor attack, so I'll admit everyone's a little on edge. We're a little stressed out, we've got some hands hovering over some buttons, we're a little nervous. Sure, something like 25 enemy aircraft was apparently spotted flying over Los Angeles in the late hours of February 24th. So, air raids then went off, blackouts were put in effect. This was not a drill, right? Or was it? What was this? This thing was getting lit up in the sky. Around 1,400 shells were blasted off and two people had a heart attack. That's how loud it was. In total, five people ended up dying from this retaliation and apparently it was a false alarm. Although many now believe that it was UFOs or aliens and that's why we were launching stuff at it. A press conference was held by the Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox, and he called the incident war nerves. People have heart attacks. He's like, oops, I was nervous, my bad, slipped. Little quick reaction there. Number 10, overnight visitor. Oh, this one definitely gives me the chills. I don't like it. This video was taken from a surveillance camera that was placed inside of a couple's home. Not outside, Inside. This is scary, and this I hope this never happens to anybody watching this video. The footage caught something while they were both asleep, and it's one of the creepiest things that I've ever seen. When the couple woke up the next day, they were unable to find a purse that they knew was in the home right before they went to sleep. So they decided to check their security cameras, and this is what they found. As they were sleeping, a man crept in and was so quiet that he didn't wake them or their dogs up. No, he stood at the top of the stairs watching them sleep for a few minutes, which just adds another layer of Ew, to this whole scenario. Yeah, always check those nooks and crannies before you go to sleep, I guess. Number nine, Russian Bigfoot caught on tape. The exact location of where this video was taken is still unknown. In fact, there isn't a ton known about this video at all, but what is known is that it was taken somewhere in Russia. That's about it. And people actually believe that it captures the real Bigfoot or one of the many Bigfoots out there. This is the Russian one. They got a Russian Bigfoot. What do we all think here? I wanted to start with one of the most insane videos I could find. I think I nailed it. How'd I do? I don't know. There's one comment dives in further. The user says, the title of the original video was called Chichuna, but in Russian script. The creature hops, sometimes sideways, like a lemur. Of course, lemurs have tails, which make that type of movement easier. And Chichunas are sometimes described as having tails, but this creature doesn't appear to have one, does it? No, it looks like a, a blob of scariness. I don't even know. The original footage was in all Russian and claimed to have been shot in Siberia. It also featured a boy and a dog in the foreground who didn't appear to be all that concerned, but I still believe believe this footage to be genuine. That's one of the top comments, so you know someone did their research. Number eight, Titanic inspection card. This inspection card once belonged to a woman named Marion Meanwell. What could possibly be creepy about an inspection card, you ask? Well, it shows how Marion was not intended to be on the Titanic, but by some turn of events, she unfortunately found herself as one of the passengers that went down with the ship. Now the card shows that she was originally meant to be traveling on a ship called the Majestic. For some reason, the trip she originally had planned was delayed and she instead was assigned to the ill-fated Titanic 
Titanic. Yeah, you can see the word majestic is literally crossed out of her card. You know, adds to the creepy element because it shows her literal change in plans. Number seven, Norway lights. Natural light phenomena is common in our big, beautiful planet. The northern lights, the green flash, solar eclipses, you name it. I bet those were all pretty alarming back in ancient times. Now, some of these natural events look otherworldly. They look cosmic almost. Most of the time, there's an explanation waiting, but for the mysterious glowing orbs floating over Norway, the Hasdalen lights, as locals call them, we still need some answers. Scientists have been trying to gather research, and in 2014, after many impressive light shows, their best guess is a natural battery that charges underground, and then emits this light show above. Maybe this has something to do with the uh, reoccurring lights over Phoenix. Could be the same phenomena happening, who knows. Number six, the cool time traveler. Do you believe in time travel? If your answer is no, maybe this next one, maybe it'll change your mind or keep you open to the concept. It's a common theme in movies, Back to the Future, Loopers, Avengers. Time travel plots are fun, but they're absolute nonsense. Or are they? When we see a case like the Cape Scott story, we can't help but be intrigued a little bit. Time travel or not, this is an interesting photo. It comes from Ray Peterson's book, The Great Cape Scott Story. That book was from 1974, but the actual photo used in the book was taken over 100 years ago. And in the photo, it shows this modern looking guy rocking shorts, maybe jorts, who knows? He has messy morning surfer hair, dippity do, three hold, you know, that kind of stuff. He doesn't look like he's from that time period at all. This also has happened more than once, like the time traveling hipster. I don't know, I'm pretty sure it's my cousin. That looks like a guy I know. Definitely not a guy from the 1900s, that's for sure. Number five, skunk ape. This one is exactly what it sounds like. The skunk ape was seen back in 2000, so hopefully, if it's a real thing, it's long gone. Hopefully it's dead by now, it's pretty gross. Two photos were taken of the supposed skunk ape, and this thing looks like Bigfoot's cooler, older cousin, you know? That cousin who has a lava lamp, does kickflips in the garage in October, that kind of cousin, that's the skunk ape, really. An anonymous source sent the Sarasota County Sheriff's Department these photos. They mailed them in, which for starters, that's pretty jarring to receive. Just a creature, just Bigfoot, put it in the mail. But she claims these photos were taken in her actual backyard and that this creature was not a black bear. It wasn't anything we've seen before. I personally don't think that's a black bear. If anything, it's just a really large, odd looking dog. Those teeth alone are a red flag either way. I want nothing to do with that. Number four, Solway Spaceman caught on photo. Look, we've all been photobombed before. It's a blessing in disguise. You look back at prom photos, some dude sneezing in the background while you're, you know, having the moment of your life. It's the best, we love it. But when Jim Templeton took a photo of his daughter in an otherwise empty marsh, long before Photoshop existed, it appears an astronaut just crashed the family moment. He just had to pop up in the photo in the background. Now, Jim assures us that nobody was around, which I believe, otherwise, what a weird photo to take in an empty field. I'd be like, hi, get away from my daughter. Just, yeah, 17 meters to the left, thanks. Also, the fact that this man looks like he's from space. Yeah, that makes it more believable, no? What are we looking at right now? Who is this? It's so, so creepy. Kodak even got involved in this story, right? Like Kodak, the company Kodak. They confirmed this photo was not tampered with and they know everything. They made Avatar, so they know what's up. Let's run everything by Kodak from now on, deal? Number three, Worstead Church Visitor. Okay, time to get a little paranormal. We love those. Hit the lights. Back in 1975, Peter and Diane Berthelot were visiting the Worstead Church in the UK. It was beautiful, right? So like any visitor does, Peter, took a photo with his nice Kodak camera, right? He wants to see the truth with his Kodak. Peter took a photo of his lovely wife sitting in the spectacle of a church, but later on, once the photo was developed, somebody else was all of a sudden in the photo now. Or something, we don't really know. Right on the bench behind Diane, there appears to be a person in all white. How calming is that? Maybe it's a wedding, maybe it's their big day. We love it. When the couple went back to the church to ask about who it was, a local suggested they may have gotten photo proof of the white lady, the spirit of a healer who haunts the church. I mean, and as far as surprise ghosts go, that's pretty tame. That's a pretty tame encounter. That's how it should be. Could have been a lot worse. They're like, oh, that's the demon. That's Daryl the demon. Yeah, you don't want any part of that. Number two, Black Knight Satellite. Not to be confused with Martin Lawrence Black Knight. That's, you know, although that's pretty historical and memorable in itself. The Black Knight Satellite is something that has been orbiting our planet for God knows how long. We're guessing thousands of years. Everything else on this list is quite recent, but this myth is ancient. 
This photo here you've probably seen at one point or another. It was taken back in 1998 during an American mission to the International Space Station. Apparently this guy has been hovering over our Earth just watching us. It's some sort of alien satellite. That's a fun theory, no doubt about it. But during a spacewalk in 1998, one of the thermal covers came loose and drifted away from the station. Could this be that cover that just floated off and wrapped itself around a rock or something? Or it could be an ancient night satellite. One of the two. And finally, number one, the doorbell liquor. Nice, we gotta end with the weirdest thing I've ever seen. This one's short and sweet. Not much explaining to do here, obviously. Does what it says in the can. Back in 2019, a man was caught on surveillance, a doorbell camera, approaching a home in a neighborhood in Salinas, California. He doesn't say much, he just shows up, doesn't drop off any package, nothing like that. He just shows up and uh, starts licking the doorbell. Not the camera, but the actual doorbell, like the button. He must have rang the bell hundreds of times because he did this for three hours straight. His jaw muscles must be insane. The homeowner said in a following interview after seeing said footage, uh, I quote, oh boy, that is just weird. Yeah, that's what they said to that footage for three hours of a man licking their doorbell. They're like, oh boy, that's weird. If that was me, I'd move. I'd be halfway packing. I'd be like, oh boy, that's weird. Grab a box, let's go. We're moving. To start us off, it doesn't matter if I'm dead or alive, you should invite me. Number 10 is Skeletal Dinner Guest. For my people who hate to feel discluded, you'd probably love the members of the Postmortem Club. All members were present when they held their annual breakfast meeting, including club president J.M. McAdoo, who had died the previous year. You'll see in the photo presiding president Oakley Smith, club members, and the skeleton of Mr. McAdoo gathered together for breakfast with the skeleton at the head of the table. One of the rules of the club is that each member will will his or her skeleton to it for attendance to the club despite death. They even gave him a cigarette as you can see because smoking can't kill you if you're a skeleton. Number 9 is human depravity at its finest, the Stanford Prison Experiment. University professor Philip Zimbardo's execution of a power imbalance study in a prison ended disastrously. The Stanford Prison Experiment commenced on August 14th of 1971 with student volunteer groups comprising of 11 guards and 10 prisoners to see how they would behave on their own inside of a fabricated prison. The goal is to assess how quickly and intensely even educated or normal people can turn into cruel or sadistic ones under the right conditions. And man, was it fast. Six days in, Philip had to call off the experiment as guards were increasingly abusive to the inmates, spraying them with fire extinguishers, forcing them to clean toilets barehanded, denying them food, or just simply beating on them. The inmates and few guards who were visible minorities faced the worst treatment out of everyone. The study and the eerie photos of it inside left behind a chilling look at what humans are capable of. A killer's plea is number eight. All right, so obviously someone who takes other people's lives shouldn't get to plea anything, but in the case of the 1946 lipstick killer, their plea wasn't one for freedom or for mercy. At a Chicago crime scene, the perpetrator used lipstick to write on the wall, quote, for heaven's sake, catch me before I kill, I cannot control myself. This message may actually sound kind of familiar. It's because TV shows, including Criminal Minds, Castle, Law and Order, and so many more, have actually taken inspiration from this image and its written message for varying episodes. The man who had written this message, William Hirons, gets his wish as he's caught soon after. He was convicted and at the time of Hirons death in 2012, he'd been locked up for approximately 66 years, making him the longest serving inmate in the USA. William's message is a reminder that not all those who commit heinous crimes are in their right of mind and sometimes they have no ability to control their actions. While it's not an excuse, it is an explanation. Number 7 is the sacrifice of Michael Rockefeller. Michael Rockefeller Rockefeller was the son of New York governor and soon to be US Vice President Nelson Rockefeller and he famously disappeared in Papua New Guinea in 1960s. This photo is of his first trip there. Rockefeller can be seen centered and smiling as indigenous people circle and run around him. Michael is known for his travels. He loved to visit the unexplored and untouched areas of society and learn about cultures many considered primitive. He saw the art and beauty in them. This desire for adventure took Rockefeller to the remote reaches of Papua New Guinea in 1961. They arrived near the island of Dutch on November 19th, and even though they were 12 miles from shore, Rockefeller reportedly told anthropologist Renee Wassing, I think I can make it, and jumped into the water and headed for land, and was never seen again. It's believed at first that he drowned, but Rockefeller had done a swim like that to shore actually multiple times. Because he was a member of a super rich American dynasty, there was a massive search. Ships, airplanes, helicopters, everything combed the region for any sign of him. They found nothing. National Geographic reporter Carl Hoffman offered a far more disturbing thesis than drowning in his 2014 book 
book, Savage Harvest. The island Rockefeller swam to was inhabited by the Azmid, an uncontacted and primarily unfriendly indigenous clan. Hoffman claims to have uncovered evidence showing that Rockefeller made it to land where he was then decapitated by the Azmat people before they ceremonially him, eating his brain and using his bones likely to make weaponry and other items. The confusing unanswered end of Rockefeller air has since been debated, but it will always remain unsolved sadly. Number 6 is we're leaving on a UFO. Not as catchy as a jet plane, but Marshall Applewhite was told by aliens it was a UFO indefinitely. So Marshall had been told a lot of things by the aliens, as had his wife before her passing. Affectionately self dubbed as T and Doe after the musical scales, they believe themselves to be of the highest caliber, like T and Doe are. On the scale. The cult these two began, Heaven's Gate, is famously recognized for the tragic mass departure members took on March 26th of 1997. It's on that day that the 39 members of the cult were convinced to consume a mixture of barbiturates and applesauce and then washed it down with vodka. As one member walked around to each poisoned person and tied bags over their heads to ensure asphyxiation. This mass taking of life was discovered days later when panicked family members of cult members hadn't heard from them. One former member went to go find his beloved wife and well I'm sure you can imagine what he found. What was confusing for many was to find the group covered in purple shrouds with their feet sticking out. They wore Nike sneakers with the classic white swoop. They believed these wings were going to carry them to the heavens. Countless photos were taken by FBI and police, most of which have been leaked to public by now and depict this very scene that I'm describing. Confusing and devastating, this loss was international news and a reminder to always be aware of your own susceptibility to influence. Number 5 is the frozen man of Mount Everest. And yeah, yeah, I get it. We all know that there's tons of frozen bodies along Mount Everest, but that's not what I'm actually talking about this time. The photo you'll see is of mountain climber Beck Weathers, who in May of 1996 attempted to complete the final leg of the ascent on Everest. Despite how short the distance was, the journey caught up to Beck, and he came down with a case of snow blindness during an intense blizzard that had a wind chill of 100 degrees below zero, and he fell into a hypothermic coma. Initially, I thought I was in a dream, Weathers later recalled. Then I saw how badly frozen my right hand was, and that helped bring me around to reality. Beck was left for dead, first by his exhibition and then the second time by a rescue crew doctor who believed him beyond saving. So it's only by miracle that Beck manages to break a hypothermic coma, turn around and walk back to base camp. When he reaches camp, Beck is airlifted immediately as frostbite set in on his nose and hands, both of which are later amputated. This moment is caught in photograph and shows the frozen hand and Beck visibly unconscious being carried in a red sleeping bag. This ascent to Everest is remembered as the 1996 Mount Everest disaster and is famously covered in John Krakauer's book Thin Air and its 1997 adaption as well as films Everest and Everest 2015. So by the way, they prematurely told Beck's wife and family he had passed away. Can you imagine that emotional roller coaster? Number 4 is the Maori Trophy Heads. The native Maori of New Zealand had a cultural practice of preserving severed heads of enemies for trophy and warning purposes. They are called mokomokai and these heads were processed by first of course getting chopped off, but then boiled, smoked and sun dried. The Maori would then coat them in shark oil to prevent cracking and peeling before mounting them. When British colonizers invaded the land during the 1840s, the Maori heads were one of the famously pillaged artifacts and treasures of the colonial era. Major General Horatio Gordon Robley was in service for the British army when they were invading and pillaging New Zealand in the 1960s. He was particularly enthralled by the Maori heads and the absolute piece of you know what actually stole 35 of them for his own collection. You can see him in this photo sitting at the base of a wall with Maori heads mounted upon it. Naturally like most of what was stolen by British colonialists for the crown and or for themselves, these items were never returned to their rightful peoples and instead earn profit in British museums or collect dust in storerooms. Since the 1970s, New Zealand has had a strong record of requesting those remains back from overseas. The first major international reparation of a toy moko happened in 1985, and in 2003, New Zealand created its first government funded international reparations program. It's now seen the return of 800 Maori and Moriori remains. Number three is the Ruhr Cannibal Demonstration, an image caught by police officers as the Ruhr himself, Joaquin Kroll reenacts one of the crimes after his capture. Kroll was very particular about how he killed and only doing so in the same place on a few occasions and years apart. This and the fact of the number of other killers operating in the area at the time, it helped him evade capture. This killer started in 1955 and didn't stop for two decades until his capture. He's known to have taken 14 lives without any rhyme or reason, no preference for age, gender, race, status, everyone was on the table. Pun intended unfortunately, as Kroll wasn't just necrophilic with the bodies, he ate them too. 
after taking their lives and using their bodies, he would bring home pieces to cook. He was finally caught in 1976 after police discovered intestines from one of his victims clogging the plumbing of the apartment building. Police reported that when a neighbor had asked Kroll about them and if he had knew what had backed up the pipes earlier, Kroll simply replied, guts. Why the police felt the need to reenact his crime photos I'm not sure, but the result is several photos of Kroll propped over a volunteer in the park looking full of and primal delight that will send a shiver down your spine. Number two is the tragic death of cosmonaut Vladimir Komarov. So imagine knowing you're going to die but still walking aboard. That is what the Soviet astronaut Vladimir did on April 23rd, 1967. The craft had shown countless issues and flaws during testing to an extent where it wasn't even just Vladimir who knew this was going to happen. It was everyone working the project. So why did it go forward despite clear danger? No one was willing to back out and risk the fury or disappointment of the Soviet high command. So Vladimir could have backed out himself, but it would have doomed the next astronaut to be put on the project, who happened to be his close friend, Yuri Gargan. So he was assigned to the mission, and he decided he would do it and spare anyone else. Upon re-entry to Earth, the tragedy happens. The craft's parachute fails, and the Soyuz craft hurtled to Earth at unthinkable speeds, burning Vladimir alive inside. Photos of the craft were taken after its impact, showing a horrific scene of melted plastics, metal, and char. He became the first human to ever die in space flight and Vladimir himself was so confident this would be the case that he asked for an open casket funeral that had forced his superiors to see what they'd done to him. And so the second famous photo of this incident is taken, Vladimir's superiors standing over the mangled bunch of melted and charred human bones with nauseated horror in their gaze. And so in at number one is what's considered the creepiest photo ever taken by the internet, Broken Blanche Monnier. This is a real life horror story. Blanche is born in 1849 and starts life living lavish and beloved in her prominent French family home, ingrained with ideas of Prince Charming and happily ever afters. She remains unmarried into her 20s, however, and searches desperately for her true love so she may move away from her domineering mother. It's in 1874 that her wish is granted, and she meets an older man of status and intends to marry him. But Mama disagrees, and she's not feeling he's suitable and she needs someone else. Blanche is furious. He can support her. He's high class, a lawyer. That's everything her mother demanded she finds, and she finally found it. Blanche finally put her foot down against her mother, and her mother makes her regret it for decades to come. Blanche is locked away in the attic closet. There are no windows and only a hay mattress. Once a day, her mother would cram dinner scraps under the doorway for her to eat. Blanche's mother reminds her every day that if she gives up on her betrothed, she would free Blanche. Blanche refuses every time, even after her fiance, unbeknownst to her, passes away in 1885 while she's still imprisoned. It wouldn't have mattered, however. The public had been told by her mother that Blanche had been dead since she locked her away in 1874, so everyone just thought that was the case. Blanche Blanche, meanwhile, survives 16 years in this closet until an anonymous note to police by a maid forces authorities to search the home. They find Blanche, now middle-aged, malnourished, covered in sores and fecal matter, surrounded by vermin and rot. This moment is caught on film by police. You'll see Blanche sitting on her bed, an excited yet lost expression on her face. Her mother and brother were both charged and her mother very quickly and deservedly dies in prison while her brother manages to appeal and escape justice. Blanche is left a shell of a person from 16 years of solitary and dark confinement. She spent the rest of her life in a psychiatric care at one of the state's best hospitals, the sole heir to her mother's precious fortune and status. Yeah.